We're here at the DPI research station at Bribie Island. We've got Peter Lee, principal scientist. Mate, fantastic facility you've got here. Yeah, Dave, the centre's been here for about 20 years. It was built by the state government to support the Queensland aquaculture industry. And in the early days, it was focusing on prawns and barramundi. And they're two industries we still work closely with. Um, but we're moving on to some other species now, as you're about to find out. Yeah, it looks fantastic. I'm looking forward to seeing these cobia. <laughs> oh, they're pretty awesome fish. Thanks, mate. No worries. We're here with Paul Palmer, who's a senior biologist at the DPI Bribey Island Research Station. Paul, what are you actually doing here? We're looking at the uh, aquaculture potential of cobia or black king. Okay. Right? So the whole idea is you, you're going to grow them up, breed them, and then maybe uh, make them a commercial marketable? Absolutely. Okay. The uh, aquaculture industry in Queensland approached us in 2006 to help them evaluate the aquaculture potential of um, cobia. And um, because this species has shown huge potential overseas, there's uh, throughout Asia and many other countries, there's uh, over 40,000 metric tonnes are produced really? in sea cages around the world. And because we're looking at growing them in Queensland, our aquaculture industry around the coast in salt water is mainly focused on prawns and barramundi, and they're grown in earthen ponds. So our interest is evaluating how they can be cultured in earthen ponds. Okay, so you're going to breed them from broodstock, grow them up, get them fat, and then market them. That's right. Okay. We've uh, collected broodstock, uh, breeders, mature fish from Moreton Bay. We brought them back to the aquaculture centre, spawned them, uh, fertilised their eggs, produced larvae, grown the larvae through to uh, a larger juvenile size using methods that we've uh, developed for barramundi and other finfish species and then we've uh, grown them up to a fingerling and uh, juvenile sizes in ponds and then those uh, fish have been transported to farms in the north and the south as a state to evaluate their aquaculture potential in the grow out conditions where they'd have to grow. Can we have a look at uh, some of the broodstock and some of the juveniles? Absolutely and I'll introduce you to some of the people who are involved in the, in the whole process. Fantastic. Thank you. Come here with Luke Dutney inside one of the compounds at the DPI research station. Uh, Luke, what have you actually got going on here? Um, this is where we house our cobia broodstock. Okay. So let's go up and have a look. All right. So we've got two tanks here, two different size cobia. Tell me about this one first of all. Um, these are some of the larger fish. Uh, this pair here are wild fish that we caught uh, probably three years ago now. Um, so they're reaching the end of their useful life as broodstock because um, cobia are such a fast growing fish, they tend to outgrow our facility. So how big would those fish be? Between 30 and 35 kilos. Okay, that's fairly big. They are, they are a bit of a handful yeah. to handle, um, take a lot of feeding. Um, how much would they eat? Um, those fish, they can eat around, each fish in there could eat three kilos itself. Which really? Which is probably two blocks of fillies <laughs> to itself. Really? And then this one, smaller fish? Yeah, this is a more ideal breeding size that we've got in here. They're around 15 kilos, which gives us lots of eggs, but they're still a more manageable size for us to handle and also for feeding and housing. We can keep more of them. Okay. Now tell me about the research project. So what we're doing, following the success from our initial trials, um, we've identified some of the bottlenecks to cobia production to be able to commercialise this technology. So what we found is we were getting highly variable development from our female fish. So some of the fish, or only a few of the fish, were really good spawners, whereas a majority of the fish showed very limited or no development at all. So what we want to focus on now is finding what, find out what those mechanisms and the triggers are to promote the reproductive development in the females. So if we can identify those triggers and mechanisms that affect cobia development, we can manipulate them to ensure that our fish develop with predictable outcomes and therefore hatcheries can get predictable supply of juveniles to the farm for ongrowing. Okay, how do you actually get the eggs from the females? How do you actually do the whole transfer process? <laughs> so when it comes, we bring the fish into spawning condition using our tank system here where we can manipulate the temperature and the light to replicate the conditions in the ocean. Okay. Um, so when they're in spawning condition, we can give them an injection to actually finalise the maturation process and bring on spawning behaviour. When they, re they release the eggs into the water, the males fertilise, the eggs are positively buoyant, so they float to the top and then they'll overflow from our tanks into, into collecting baskets. So once they've spawned, we come in, we collect the eggs out of the basket and then we move them to the hatchery and the juvenile production area. So let's go and have a look. Okay. 
Okay, Luke, so uh, these are a little bit smaller than the last ones we looked at, but uh, still a fair size. This is a, an intermediate stage, is it? Yeah, that's right, Dave. These fish, we're holding, we're growing these fish on, so these will be future broodstock. Okay. So one day, they'll be part of the system that we saw earlier, and as part of the current CRC-funded project, we'll be looking at growing these on and improving the outputs from so these broodstock. How old would these ones be? These guys are only about four months at the moment. That's amazing growth rate, isn't it? Yeah, so they grow very quickly. Probably this time next year, they'll be good for broodstock, but they'll be over five kilos and we'll be looking at breeding from these fish for our right. next generation. Hey, this is Trevor Borshert, who's a fisheries technician. Trev, what have we got here? Yeah, sure. Uh, over the last few, few years, uh, we've been developing uh, larval rearing techniques for the cobia. Um, that stems from previous work, from Barramundi work here at the Broby Island Research Centre. Um, here, a major part of our uh, larval fish rearing is uh, the live production of fish food for the larvae. Um, so here we've got in these tanks here is our live um, algae cultures in these mass culture tanks. Okay, is that why it's green? Is that's, that that's correct, yes. Okay. So uh, the, the fish larvae, um, from about day two onwards, uh, they eat, uh, this is their first feed, what they okay, eat. So these are the little baby Kobe, yep. eat this green stuff. That's, that's <laughs> correct, that's correct, yes. Um, from after that, then they feed on another um, small uh, feed, which is called a rotifer, uh, which we culture here. Um, then from about a week old, uh, they feed on Artemia or brine shrimp, okay. which we culture here too. So the food is a critical part of getting them from that size to the, the 35 correct. kilo That's fish. correct, yes. So when, when they're um, in juvenile and also larval period stages, uh, they, they tend to eat a real, real lot of live food. So okay. uh, once they're after, we stock them into our uh, larval rearing tanks. Um, from about two weeks onwards, uh, then we harvest those and put them into our grow-out ponds for further grow-out. Okay, we might go and have a look at those yep, grow-out sure. ponds. Okay. Okay, Trevor, this is what you referred to as the grow-out ponds. W what have we actually got here? Yes, correct. This is one of our grow-out ponds at Briarby Island. Uh, we've currently got, in this pond here, uh, about 60,000 juvenile cobia. Uh, they're about um, 30 days old and they've been fully weaned now on a commercial um, diet, um, which is being um, fed through an automatic belt feeder that you can see here. Okay, so those that that this brown stuff is what they're actually eating. That's is it? correct. That's yeah. correct. So it's, it's quite small. It's a little bit smaller than the size of one mil. Okay. Um, and then probably next week we'll go into a one mil feed. It seems to me like they grow fairly quickly. You're saying these are what 30 days old? Yeah, only 30 days old. Okay. Correct. And so. and how long how long do they stay in here for? They'll stay here for another month or so, or probably two to three weeks. Uh, and then we're looking at harvesting them and sending them off to uh, one of the pawn farms. Okay. What the size would they be there? When we harvest them, they're looking at around four to five grams in size, so okay. they're quite large. So they pretty much put on um, a gram or two a week. Okay, yep. a bit like me. <laughs> <laughs> this is Joe Wong, fisheries technician. Joe, how does this work? Is it an automatic feeder, is it? Yeah, this is the automatic feeder. It's the com commercial available, so we bought that, and then this is like a clock. A clock, yeah? Yeah, so we pull this belt, and then load the feed, and the clock will, will drag the food, go, and then slowly release take about 24 hours to release all the feed. Okay. So they continuously supply the food for the fish. So that's why they're all hanging around this spot. That's right, this, <laughs> they, are, they, they, they can find the food here, so that's why they're locked here. Well, that's the Bribey Island DPI Research Station's Cobia project. Fantastic, innovative work they're doing here. Stay tuned, they've got lots more projects on the books. Can't wait.